The Mark 7R is undermining the whole process of buying and selling cars to make money, which is my bread and butter. Hello guys and welcome to this Volks Wizard video. Now some of you may have seen the amazing footage of the Mark 8 Golf R pounding around the Nürburgring in testing recently. Well this generally means the car is going to be in the UK on sale within the next year or so. So I thought today might be a good time to make a video explaining my opinions on the Mark 7 Golf R because this was a very significant car for Volkswagen and for Volkswagen enthusiasts as well. But if you've been a regular viewer to this channel you'll know I'm not its biggest fan. And I just thought I'd make a video explaining why, because there's more to it than me thinking this isn't the best hot hatch in the Volkswagen range. I've had a lot of grief with these cars behind the scenes that you probably do not know about. So let's start at the beginning. I bought one of the first UK customer cars. Uh, I ordered it in 2013. At the time I had a 997-911 Gen 1 Carrera 4S worth about £30,000 and it was um, I think the second or third in a string of Porsches, none of which had been particularly reliable. But I pushed the boat out, paid a bit more for a 997 to get a bit more reliability, promptly took it to Europe and had to replace the clutch, which cost me 2,000 quid in Austria. So I got back to the UK thinking, you know what, I actually fancy doing these European trips in something I don't have to worry about for a change. So I started looking and just at that point, the Mark 7 Golf R was announced. It was the autumn of 2013. I still remember the one page on it in Volkswagen Driver magazine. It said 300 horsepower for 30 grand, which got me thinking I could sell my 911, walk straight into a brand new one of those instead of a what was then an eight year old 911. And that's what I did. I joined the VW ROC forum, which is a great forum. If you're an owner, you probably already know about it, but if not, join it and sorted out my spec on with discussions on there so I went for a Lapis Blue three door I didn't really need a five door didn't want to pay extra for it and it's heavier I went for leather because I felt a car at that price point should have it I went for nav for the same reason and I like nav and I went for rear view camera because it was cheap I also went for Pretorias because they looked ace when it said RG and BH light wheel I was sold I didn't really like the, the Cadiz and still don't and these just fill the arches beautifully so it's a proper light enthusiast spec car that and I was really looking forward to it my first ever brand new car believe it or not so uh, it even arrived on the 1st of March so it took about three months to come and I think it sat at the dealers for a couple of weeks until the 1st of March I'd arranged with them to do an article on its collection and the ordering process that made the dealership look good and Neil Burkett met me at the dealership and we went straight out and did a little bit of driving up and down the dual carriageway to get some photos. In fact, we actually did the first ever review of the Golf R to be printed in the UK magazine by about two days we beat Evo. It was a very odd state of affairs, but there'd actually been no proper road tests of the R, which I must have been very brave or very stupid to put all that money into a car that had not been tested, but I just knew it couldn't really be too, too wrong, could it? So yeah, the only test had been a, an ice driving one on, in Sweden that came out, I think in February. I was just chomping at the bit, trying to get any bit of information on the car and there was nothing. But yeah, so we, uh, Neil, we did the article and yeah, it came out probably a couple of weeks after the, after the, uh, the car was delivered because we just about caught the deadline of the mag. So yeah, things started to go wrong pretty quickly though. I don't think I had a grey hair on my head when I collected it. I've got a photo of me with a sales person. But they soon started coming. I think on the day of collection, I lifted the tailgate and noticed that the screws that hold the tailgate to the body were, had been tampered with. The paint was missing off them. And then when I gave it its first wash a week later at about 300 miles, I noticed quite a lot of stuff. So firstly, there were dirt inclusions in the paint. Now, you never normally see this on a car from the factory because they're normally scrupulously clean in their body shops it's generally what happens to a car when it's been repaired but there was pretty much one on every panel they were very small but I could see them with my naked eye under the LED lights in my unit there there were also issues with swirl marks and scratches which I put down to the dealership using a dirty cover and dragging it off the car in the showroom when they presented it to me I saw them chuck it on the floor I saw it was covered in tyre dressing so yeah it wasn't particularly clean 
But the worst thing was that the front bumper was covered in a sort of fine patina of chipping. It wasn't particularly deep, but it was there, and I could again see it with my naked with the naked eye. And the car had done 350 miles, and it just wasn't acceptable to me that at that mileage that had happened. Now looking back, I pre I'm pretty sure it happened when I was doing the car to car photography on the dual carriageway near the dealership with Neil Burkett in front of me in actually my own car, another car that we'd driven down in. But the grit had been out, it was a chilly morning that, but it had been out the night before, so it was only like a fine dust. But that fine dust that the car was flicking up for me to drive into would cause only the bumper, not the bonnet or the wings, to have this sort of sandblasted appearance to them. So yeah, I wasn't particularly happy with that. I didn't feel even, I hadn't driven particularly close to the, the camera car, so I didn't feel it was right that it should be in that condition now. I thought, I thought maybe I can try and polish it off because it was only a very fine sort of layer of chipping. So I got my polisher that I've been using for years, never damaged the car with it, put it on the bumper. As soon as it touched it, it smudged the lacquer. It smudged it. I'd never seen that before. So there's clearly something wrong with that front bumper. I think being Lapis Blue, it was new to Volkswagen. They hadn't actually been making Lapis Blue cars before. I think because the car was made in the depth of winter, the bumpers are plastic. The body probably gets baked, but I can't imagine the plastic bumpers get baked an awful lot. So they allow them to dry in the air to some degree. And I just think it was so cold that it hadn't dried properly. Anyway, I figured I could get this done under warranty at my local Volkswagen Free Body Shop in Coventry. I drove there and they were pretty helpful. But when it came down to it, Volkswagen UK said these are pre-delivery problems that your dealer should have sorted out in the main. So you need to speak to your dealer. I spoke to them and they said, mm, not really that interested in helping you, to be honest. So I escalated with Volkswagen UK and got a different response from the dealer, who should have really been friendly with me. I'd done an article for them, for them for Vol in Volkswagen Driver magazine that I think they probably were just about receiving. They must have got it at that point, I think. And they just weren't very helpful. Um, but in the end, they agreed to have the car back, took it to their local body shop, which did Ferraris and Maserati, I think. They were a very high standard body shop and they were pretty good. But the dealership only dealt with me through gritted teeth. And yeah, it wasn't a particularly good experience. They gave me a Volkswagen Beetle diesel courtesy car, which isn't really the same sort of car. But hey ho, it was interesting. I wrote a magazine article on it for Volkswagen Driver magazine as a kind of review to get some use out of it. But I was very glad to see my car again a whole three weeks later. The body shop had been great, they'd kept me up to date, they sent me photos of the car in bits, the bumper stripped down, the silver bits taken off it, and to be fair, the bumper was great. In fact, they actually said, we've done it, we're not very happy with it, do you want us to do it again? And I said, yeah, and luckily the second time they got the colour match, bang on. They gave it a light polish. I think we agreed not to bother with the dirt inclusions because they might have gone through the lacquer, which would have caused more grief, you can imagine, on a three-door car. If you go through the paint there, you're kind of painting the whole side of it. So we left those. The one disappointment was that with the tailgate bolts, they really should have taken them out and sprayed them, put them back in carefully. They just touched them up with a touch-up stick, which I could have done, and it didn't look very good. But by that point, bearing in mind, I think I got the car back in June or end of May. It had been a whole three months of grief, and I think my hair was well on the way to being grey. So I just started using the car. I took it straight away for paint protection film, um, from 3M and that was all right it cost a few hundred pounds but what could you do after that I got the bonnet done or the front of the bonnet I think the front of the wings the whole of the front bumper in fact the guy took a template from my car because he'd never done one before and he sold quite a few after that using my templates and then I took it on its second trip so I kind of missed out between getting the car and going back to the dealership I'd taken it to the Nürburgring and Bruges and had a really good drive. It was a real good warm up for a longer trip. So in the June, no 911s this time, we took the Golf R, put the seats down, filled it up with stuff, took my bike, which I'd never been able to do in a Porsche before, and drove down to Seefeld in Austria and had a great week there. The car was in its element. It went up Alpine passes, fully laden, still felt really great. It was great on fuel. Could drive it all day, didn't feel tired, which we were driving it all day. And in bad weather, it was great. It was a real good all-rounder. And then after Austria, we drove down to Italy as well. So yeah, we did quite a few miles in that trip. 
Uh, we did one more trip as well in the September down to Lake Constance. So of the 8,000 miles I did in that car in about six months, 6,000 were abroad. And I think it went into probably like 14 or 15 different countries. But when I got it back to the UK, it just seemed a bit dull here. It was brilliant when you pushed it to the limits abroad, but here it was just like driving a normal Golf most of the time. And, you know, if you drove it hard to get some thrills out of it, you were going so fast, it just felt irresponsible. So in the October, knowing that it was probably going to lose a lot of money thanks to the lease deals that had just been announced, I put it up for sale and actually sat on it right through the winter because I think even today it's still hard to sell performance cars in the winter. Your windows generally April to probably September. After that, it's, it's tricky. So I just sat on it. I think I kept the price, price there or thereabouts. I think I got 28 990 for it or something like that. I took a part exchange, the profit of which paid for my depreciation, so I couldn't really complain about that too much. So it was a good two to two and a half years after I waved goodbye to my own example in April 2015 before I started buying Mark 7 Golf R's to sell. The reason for that was because actually Volkswagen had messed up the used market because they'd made leasing a new one so cheap. Why would you buy a second hand one when it was cheaper to lease a new one? The only problem with leasing was that it made it very expensive if you added options, so nobody did. So Volkswagen sold a lot of cars with basically no options. If you saw Pretorias, it would be like hen's teeth. If you saw Winterpack, it would be yeah, pretty rare as well. Leather, navigation, all very, very hard to come by. Thankfully, some people did order Lapis Blue. They weren't all red, but my word, there were quite a lot of cars. So I started kicking tires at the auctions in I think it must have been 2017 because the lease cars were coming through in numbers. I clearly remember an auction at BCA in Birmingham. BCA one of the biggest auction houses in Europe and they're the company that Volkswagen pretty much exclusively used for the disposal of all their leased return cars. So at the, the end of the lease you should really give the car back but Volkswagen did give people the option to buy some but they wanted so much money for them that most people just gave them back and the cars were disposed of at auction. Now I'm pretty sure by the time I had access to buy them Volkswagen main dealers already had the option but had said no probably because the spec and the condition weren't very good. But I remember clearly 30 of the 300 cars at that auction were ours. Now if you think about that number BCA probably hadn't auctioned 30 Mark 6 hours in the whole time it had been out. So 30 in one, one sale was, was crazy. Now, generally, when cars are there in that kind of numbers, you can get a good deal because supply and demand are in your favour as a buyer. But that wasn't really the case. I think the independent dealers who, not really like me, but ones who fill up a forecourt because they have to and because they do a lot of finance, thought the car was great. It's the first opportunity they'd had to buy them, really, because they hadn't come through the auctions much until that point and yeah they'd lost money they were like in the low 20s now so they they were you know relatively good value um so they were buying them but for me i was like well i you know i had a i think they should have leather or pretorias or be lapis blue and these guys were just buying anything in any condition because they had to fill their forecourts up and the person buying it on finance probably wasn't that fussy about it so for me as a dealer they weren't particularly good then and that's before the problem started arising so I think at the end of 2017 I bought one that was actually a main dealer Partex it came from BCA the one owner car white three-door with Pretorias uh, it didn't have much else on it but still looked pretty good and the condition was amazing 12,000 miles I think it had I still clearly remember driving it back on the M42 and the clutch slipping I thought I was in the DSG car and it had dropped a gear but no it was the clutch slipping I didn't know at that time it was such an issue otherwise I would have been a bit more cautious over buying them but what do you do most of the cars most dealers buy go through auctions you cannot test drive them what bca do do is they charge you a, a premium on top of the buyer's fee that protects you from problems they do a little test in their yard that's probably from here to the shutters where they can't test things properly and they advertise it as buy with peace of mind well i got on the phone to bca and said the clutch is slipping they said i'm sorry we can't help you i said well it says in your advert you can buy with peace of mind they said sorry can't help you Anyway, persisted, contacted the advertising standards agency saying, well, they say you can buy with peace of mind, but I've got this a thousand quid bill now and they're telling me to go and do one. And actually, eventually, BCA took that line out of their advertising, which was quite satisfying. They also eventually paid for about 80% of the cost for Volkswagen to do the work 
I took it to Solihull VW. They said we might be able to do it under warranty, but lo and behold, your car's in bits now. You're going to have to pay us a grand to have it put back together, which was actually discounted thanks to a guy that I used to know who worked there, Gareth. Thanks for that, Gareth. Still owe you one for that. Um, so yeah, the bill would probably be well north of a thousand quid. And I don't know if it was that car or another one, but it had to be serviced. So I took it to somebody I know at Cheltenham VW and he said, by the way, your coolant module's leaking and that would normally be about a thousand pounds, but we can do it for you under warranty because it's not three years old yet. I said, do it, thanks. And is that common? He said, yeah, yeah, it probably happened to all of them. And lo and behold, you know, I bought cars since where you, you have to get that done. And it's really hard to do as well. I do it myself, but it's really, really complicated. I still clearly remember somebody's pretty much brand new are being in the dealership in bits, the whole front end off it, just so they could get to it. I think technicians now at dealerships know how to do it in a less involved way, but it's still a big job. And I've seen quotes of a thousand quid. I've seen quotes of 1400 quid. Bearing in mind, this is something that a nearly new Volkswagen should not be doing. Same with the clutch. You should not have to be faced with a thousand quid plus to replace the clutch. Now, bearing in mind, the margins on these cars are well under two grand. I think Cap rec says something like a, a, a margin between what you pay as a dealer and what you sell retail on a good example is 1800 quid. You can see that it's the whole, the Mark 7R is undermining the whole process of buying and selling cars to make money, which is my bread and butter. So yeah, that's kind of really, really upset me. Future purchases haven't been without grief as well. I mean, obviously I know clutches are an issue now and I test drive them, but really, you know, I bought one from a guy who lived in, uh, in the West Midlands and it was in the urban part of it. We drove it around there, I drove it up some hills, it didn't seem to slip. I even drove it deliberately on the dual carriageway here, which is pretty flat, no slip, trying to provoke it. Sold it to a guy who lived in Wales, the Welsh borders, and guess what? Within a week he said the clutch is slipping and he needed to contribute for a new one. So we kind of we sorted that out in the end amicably, but it still cost me a good few hundred pounds that I wasn't expecting to pay, particularly once the car had been sold and I tested it. That was frustrating. I've had more coolant issues in the meantime. We've done one here in-house and it was bad. It had to be done twice. It's such a fiddly job and there's a pitfall to doing it that can cause it to leak. Um, so yeah, it's really not been the best car for me as a dealer. There was also one other car where somebody had uh, applied for a logbook and got it from DVLA and gone to the police and said it had been stolen from them. And the police, without checking some basic facts, had put it on the police um, national computer as being stolen. The guy I had just sold it to had it confiscated off him on the M42 and it took him four to five weeks to get it back and then they tried to charge him for storage. It's not the car's fault but apart from all the issues with the car because they're popular with thieves and criminals there is a lot of grief as well. I mean I never know when I'm going to be attacked by somebody who comes and test drives one of these. It's, it really is an occupational hazard that the profit doesn't justify if there is any profit. Oh, and let's not forget the time I had to spend £5,000 on an R gearbox for on a DSG card that was under warranty. So I haven't really sold many of them, but I'm pretty sure over half of them have caused me grief, well over half of them. So yeah, I took a car, bought a car for one owner, a mature guy, retired, lived in the Cotswold, had it from new, took it to Blade in VW to be serviced, um, whenever it was required and he was buying a v, uh, BMW i3. He was no longer commuting to the train station to commute into London because he'd retired and he offered me the R. And yeah, it was lovely, one owner car. He was sensible enough to extend the warranty to five years from the original three years, paid for that when new. So it's just like the three year warranty, but longer had it serviced as required as you would do. Why would you invalidate the warranty you'd paid handsomely for by not having it serviced on time? He did it whenever the dealer said. Unfortunately, the dealer were A, late advising him on the DSG gearbox oil, and B, didn't put enough oil in it. So I bought it off him, and in the December 2018, going into 19, sold it to a chap who was commuting from Oxfordshire down to London. He worked for the BBC. He was doing a lot of motorway work. Gearboxes need to have oil to the right level if they're doing steady motorway work. Within, I think, two months, he was complaining about it being noisy. So we sent it to the main dealer because it was under warranty, wasn't it? But they said, ah, it's not under warranty because the 
DSG oil change was done late. I looked at the bills. I couldn't find any reason why the customer was to blame for that. I can't. It's still a grey area. Should you know what's due when, or should the dealer advise you? Well, the dealer hadn't advised him correctly. In fact, I think because they took him three weeks after he told them he wanted it done to book him in to get it in to do it, he'd gone over the little threshold of like a thousand miles that VW allow you to go over. So I said, well, no way I'm going to pay VW for, for, for a gearbox. Take it down to APS, who were luckily, there in Brackley, the car was in toaster. Luckily, and this is so lucky, the owner lived near APS as well, in fact, nearer than where the car was at VW. So he took it there and they, they looked at the oil out and they said, look, it should be like four litres. It's got like three litres in it, so it's not leaked. We can only assume when the oil chain was done, it was underfilled. Volkswagen weren't having any of this. I wrote a really carefully worded letter to the, I think, the top man for passenger cars in the UK, a guy called Andrew Savas. He'd only recently started at Milton Keynes. Not interested at all. And the only thing I could do then was to get APS to, to replace the gearbox, which I'm pretty sure cost around £5,000 in total to do. So after that, I pretty much swore I'd never buy another R, but you can't really blame the car for that. That was a technician and yeah, okay, it's not gonna be practical to check the level every time. I think it's just a one-off. The guy, the dealership that was involved in that, I didn't mention it at the time, but they've gone out of business now, so I can. They were called Blade Volkswagen. They were based in Gloucester. Unfortunately, there was no redress with them because they weren't in business anymore at all. And you couldn't really prove it. It was a really messy situation. But, you know, from the sort of 10 or so hours I've sold to get that much expense, cost and grief and grey hairs, hopefully you can understand why I'm not their biggest fan. But with the Mark 8 being simply an evolution of the Mark 7.5R, which for me was a much better car than the Mark 7 because it looked better, you got a better basic spec, it seems to be more reliable, better built, and very few of them are manual so you don't get the clutch issues, the Mark 8 could well be the best R so far. Not only to look at and drive, but also in that crucial area for a Volkswagen reliability. Anyway guys, I hope you've enjoyed this Volks Wizard video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. Please comment, I'll try and reply to all of them for the first couple of days at least. Please share it and please, please, please subscribe. A very high proportion of you, I think like 82% are not subscribed to this channel. So if you've enjoyed it, all I ask, just click that subscription icon. It's free of charge and I'll see you for the next one soon.